Well, good to see all of you here this morning. Glad to have you here. We uh, hope we will be a blessing to you as we get into the Word. So, <clears throat> there we're going to look at a couple of scriptures. You can turn first to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. <clears throat> and as you do that, now if you were here for the 9 o'clock or if you heard, we're going to hear about the 9 o'clock, uh, during the 9 o'clock session, I made mention that this would actually tie into the 9 o'clock. And it does to the degree that uh, we were talking about people, uh, whenever you minister to someone, uh, you should be able to take responsibility for them getting healed in that situation. Now, that does not mean that you are supposed to become that person's permanent crutch which means every time they have a problem, they call you. Every time they have a situation that they call you. The idea is that you minister to them, and then in that process of them being healed, especially if they are, if they are believers or if they become a believer, then you should be discipling them into the truth of the Word of God so that they can get it for themselves next time and so they can give it to other people also. So the key is that it continues on, not that we just create a certain class of people that go around healing the sick and end up becoming like doctors to people, right? That's not the idea. And so, but at the same time, we are to take responsibility uh, for people. Once we see them, they are our responsibility. As the Bible says, we are our brother's keeper. And so we are to help them in, in whatever area uh, they need help in any area. Now, one of the reasons, and if again, referring back to the 9 o'clock, there was a situation uh, where some people, J.J. Lynn people, were actually um, telling people that, uh, you know, they had prayed for them apparently, or in and, and some cases, I know that's the case, but in some cases they hadn't prayed for them, but told them, uh, before God will heal you, you have to get all the sin out of your life. Well, if you've been around this message very long, you know, and if you've read the Bible, it's what it says, you know that's not true. Everybody Jesus healed were sinners. None of them were saved. None of them were righteous. Okay, They were all sinners and they had to get saved. And so uh, nobody had, and Jesus never told anybody to get rid of their sin before he healed them. As a matter of fact, he said, uh, now that you've been healed, whatever, now go and sin no more. So he would encourage them to change their life but the goodness of God was to draw them to repentance. And so we emphasize that and we will continue to emphasize that because that truth had been lost for 70 years until about close to about, uh, well, publicly about around the year 2000. Uh, we started bringing it out again and proving it from the Bible. So this morning, uh, now the reason people do that, I want to get right to the point. The reason people sometimes revert back, once you've heard this message and you've seen the truth of it in the Bible, then the reason you would revert back to telling people, well, there must be sin in your life or you got to get the sin out before God will heal you. It's usually because that person has failed, the person praying for them, ministering to them, has failed to get them healed. And so they had to come up with a reason for that failure. And rather than just admitting that they were not walking with God where they should be, they end up putting it back on the person. It's human nature. Uh, and unfortunately, there's still a lot of humanity left in us, okay? And so that started happening. So we had to come out very strongly against that to emphasize that we are to walk in a place with God where we can set the captives free. Simple as that. Now, the reason, though, people are not walking with God, or let me put it this way, the reason they get to that place where they cannot um, deliver the power of God is usually because of the image of themselves that they have in themselves. Now, and it's sad to say because people have gone to the new man, they've heard about the new creation, and yet they still revert back to that whenever they don't see success in an area rather than just saying, you know what? I should be stronger. I should be walking where I'm supposed to be walking, and I'm not. And rather than admit that, <clears throat> then they end up putting it off on the person that's sick, which is unacceptable. So, uh, <clears throat> this morning, I just want to share some things about the image that you have in you. So, I would ask you, what is your image of you? And so, you know, I could say, I could start this by saying, you know, we've heard this said before in different connotations, I guess, would be, you know, who do you think you are? 
right? Or who do you think you are? Or, I mean, I've heard it all, you know, emphasis on each different word. I've heard all the different things of it, you know. Um, it, it, it's, it's been amazing. I've gone into hospital rooms, uh, went in, started to minister to a person, commanded their body to be healed, commanded the sickness to go. And a person standing off to the side that has been there, you know, the full range from family to another minister, <clears throat> something along those lines, and they will interrupt while I'm ministering to this person and say, now, hold on, who do you think you are? You know, uh, you're, you're taking away God's sovereignty by thinking, no, I'm emphasizing God's sovereignty over sickness and disease, over the things that Jesus defeated. And so we're not taken away from God's sovereignty. We're enforcing it. Amen. Amen? And so <clears throat> we see this all the time when people ask that, well, who do you think you are? Well, and then, you know, they'll say, and I know when I was growing up, I used to, you know, who died and made you king? Uh, Jesus. Exactly. That's who did it. He died and made me a king and a priest unto my God. So there you go. There's the answer to that one. So now here's the thing. I'm just going to read a couple of these things to you first off. Who, do you, who you think you are matters more than what anybody else thinks you are. Okay, now I'm going to say, okay, so far you agree, right? <laughs> okay. And now I'm going to say something that your head's probably not going to want to agree with, but just hold off, okay, until I finish it, all right? <clears throat> the next one, okay. <clears throat> like I just said, who you think you are matters more than what anybody else thinks you are, right? That includes God. Who you think you are matters to you more than what God, or who God thinks you are. I know you don't want to agree with that. And, and, I, and I agree with how you're thinking about it. I, I agree with you, how you're thinking about it. <clears throat> what I mean is this. <clears throat> when you got born again, you got recreated in your spirit. At that point, you were made, remade, we might say, into the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. We were predestined by God to be conformed to the image of Christ. Is that right? Amen. Now, <clears throat> so that's what's in you. That's, that's who you are in the spirit. That's what you look like in the spirit. That's what you can do in the spirit. As a matter of fact, according to Jesus himself, you can even do more than he did. Amen. Is that right? <clears throat> now, so if that's God's, see, that's God's image of you. When God looks in you, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I didn't even bring my water. <clears throat> when God looks in you <clears throat> and sees what's in you, he sees Jesus. Because that's what you were recreated of the same substance, essence, likeness, nature, character, potential. All of that is in there, all right? But then when he looks on your outside, right, which the Bible says man looks on the outer, but God looks on the inner, right? How many of you are glad God looks on the inner? Amen, okay. <clears throat> when he looks on the inner. Now, if he looked at your outward man, then he would say, wait a minute, there, there's a problem here because the inward doesn't match the outward. And that's the process of Christianity from the time you get born again to having your mind renewed so that you begin to walk more and more like Jesus. Amen? Now, first and foremost, remember this. What I'm talking about today has nothing to do <clears throat> with being a preacher. Right? What I'm, and matter of fact, it would do me no good to preach to you or teach to you <clears throat> a message that only applied to preachers or what I would call uh, full-time ministers in full-time ministry. Does that make sense? So because Jesus doesn't look at that any different, he sees all of us technically as full-time ministers if we're Christians, right? No matter where we are, no matter where you get a paycheck from, he sees you as always on duty, right? <clears throat> always ready and willing and able, right? Now, <clears throat> the reason I say <clears throat> that God, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> okay, I'll confess. In the back, I was eating some peanut butter. Because <laughs> you notice I wasn't doing this during the 9 o'clock. <clears throat> it's the peanut butter, and if I'd have washed it down with Coke, it would have burned it all out. It would be no problem, right? But instead, I was drinking water, and it takes more water than Coke to wash out peanut butter. So... <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, so if you're going to bring me water, bring me a Coke. No, I'm just kidding. No. So, okay, now, seriously. But, <clears throat> now, 
the reason, okay? So in, in, in you, potentially, is Jesus. That's your potential. You can do everything he did and more, right? That's your potential. Now, what you actually realize or what you actually get to uh, walk in depends on how much your mind has been renewed to the Word of God. But that mind, your, your mind has been renewed to the image that God has of you. Do you get that? Now, so right now in you, if you're born again, you look like Jesus. So then why aren't all Christians walking like Jesus, acting like Jesus, and seeing the same works as Jesus all the time, instantly? Why? Because their image in them is different than God's image of you. That's why I said your image of who you think you are is more important even than God's image of you. Why? Because how you think you are is how high you will rise or what you will do, right? Why? Because God has no limits, Amen. right? Amen. Except for the limits we put on him. And those limits are the limits that we say, oh, well, <clears throat> I can't imagine God ever using me to raise the dead. Okay, well, guess what? You just limited God right. in your life, right. right? So even though God said, well, man, just next week, I, I've got a dead raising plan for you, right? <laughs> Why? Because you're going to be right there when it happens, and now I'm going to have to find somebody else to use because I, you just told me that you can't do that, so you're limiting me. So your image of you impacts you more than God's image of you. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's why I said your image of you is more important than God's image of you. Now, understand, God's image in you is who you're supposed to be and where you're headed toward, right? Right? So the real key is getting all those roadblocks, getting all those things out of the way uh, so that you can become and act and function more like Jesus as quickly as possible. Does that make sense? Amen. So now, who God, now this is who God thinks you are is who you truly are, Amen. right? N saved or unsaved, <coughs> right? What God thinks about you is who you truly are, right? If God looks at you and you're unsaved and you know you're unsaved and God knows you're unsaved, right? Then he's going to look at you as unsaved. Oh, he's bringing me water. I assume. <laughs> okay. Thank you, I'm sir. I'm going to drink it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, it's not a Coke. <clears throat> so. But that'll get us started there. Okay. <clears throat> now, so you have to first know what the image that God has of you so that you can align your image with the image that God has. Because the worst thing you can do is have a different image. And if you have a different image, and, and it's amazing because here, I even wrote down some of these things. See, if you're, if you're unsaved, then God sees you as unsaved, but he will treat you good anyway because we read in the first session that God is good to the just and the unjust. Isn't that right? He's good to good and evil people. I mean, he's, he's God, he's good. But at the same time, how much he can work through you and for you is limited by your image of you. Right now, what I mean, and it, you already hopefully you found numbers thirteen. Okay, we'll be there in just a second. So I'm just going to read a couple of these things to you. So now, who you think you are will determine the height to which you will rise in this world and in God. Right? For instance, if you think, if you say, if I said, okay, who are you? Well, you could give me your name, and that'd be one aspect. But if I said, okay, who are you? What are you? You go through it. Oh well, you know. People have all kinds of different images. They have, in, inside, they have an image where they say, I'm, I'm broke, uh, I'm sick. Uh, maybe, you, you know, for some reason you have an image, I'm dumb, something like that, right? Uh, you know, it's kind of like uh, the, the, the teacher that asked all the, the students and said, you know, on the first day of school, who, who in here thinks you're dumb? And nobody moved, and she said, so nobody in here thinks you're dumb. One little, she said, okay, whoever... Um, if you, if you think you're dumb, I want you to stand up. And nobody stood up for a little while. She said, okay, so, so nobody in here thinks, and then finally one little boy stood up. And she said, now, do you really think you're dumb? He said, no, ma'am, but I just hated seeing you stand there by yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but they just, you just have to have an image, okay? The image that you have of yourself oh my <clears throat> will determine where you go. And if you've been raised with an idea or a mindset of poverty, then you, if you don't break that, that thing will carry on through, through generations. 
Uh, if you've been raised around people that were, as we would call them, hypochondriacs, you know, not, maybe they were always sick or maybe they weren't, but always talked like they were sick or acted like they were sick, then that will eventually get into you to at least to a degree. <clears throat> so, and if you're constantly told, well, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything, then that's going to be there unless you overcome it. Now, you can overcome it because your image of you is more important than anybody else's image of you. Amen? And so even whenever, you know, when I started, and to, you know, to my parents' credit, uh, I never, I, in, in all my life, I never remember them ever saying, you're dumb, you can't do this. Or On the other hand, I heard them say, whatever you put your mind to, you can do, you, you know, you can achieve this, you can do this. I mean, that, that's what I was raised around. So there was a, uh, no, there was a lot of negative stuff but there was nothing ever negative put into me about me, right? And so I was raised with a fairly good self-image in that sense. And then as I started reading the Bible, I thought, man, I really sold myself short there because God has a much greater image. You know, I thought I had a good self-image, but God has a much greater image of me than I do of myself. And so when I started finding out what his image was, I remember I started watching guys like A. Allen, Jack Coe, these guys on video, and I started saying, well, God, you, you did it for them, you'll do it for me. You did it through them, you'll do it through me. Why? Because you don't love sick people any less today, and you were using them because the people were sick. You weren't using them because they were great. You were using them because people were sick. Well, they're still sick people, so you'll use me because you love sick people. And so, but now I didn't just say that once or twice. I actually watched videos, and I would sit there. And whenever Jack Coe would pull somebody out of a wheelchair, then I was right there with him, and I'm, I'm doing it right there with him. And when A. Allen would grab somebody off of a stretcher and pull them up, I was right there, and I, I told God, we need that. i got to have that. That's what we need back in the church. And so I started, and I would literally just take time to just take a walk and just, for lack of a better term, just picture myself in a healing service. Now, this is way back before anybody was asking me to preach for anything. Nobody was asking me to pray for them, nothing. And I would, I would sit in my chair in, in, in our house, and I would sit there, and I would just picture me just like Alan pulling these people out of wheelchairs and lifting these people up and telling this person, be healed in Jesus' name and healing. And, and, and I, I did that for a long period of time. And I didn't realize what I was actually doing, but I was really recreating the image into my mind of what God had put in my spirit. And so there, th this is the big problem. People have a different image in them of who they are rather than what God has for them. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is the real key. And I want to talk about this a little bit today about, about the image. And I want to show you some things. Now, first off, it is vital that your image of who you are is the same as God's image of who you are. Otherwise, you'll never uh, do it what God has ordained you to do, whether you're in, behind a pulpit or in marketplace or wherever else. It, see, w the, the location of your ministry doesn't matter. How you minister, where you minister doesn't matter. It's the fact that people need help anywhere you are, and you are able to help them anywhere you are, right? It, all help doesn't come from behind the pulpit, right? So, now, <clears throat> two things, you might want to write these down. First off, most people only look at their circumstances to determine who they are and what they're capable of. In other words, you determine everything that you are capable of or that you will do, or you're, you, you determine it by looking at your current circumstances. If you're, you know, having financial problems, that's where you see yourself. And if it's been going on a period of time, the longer it goes on, the more that image <clears throat> will be reinforced in you rather than you seeing yourself the way God sees you, right? Because God doesn't see you having financial problems. God doesn't see you having health problems. You understand what I mean by that? I'm, I'm not saying he doesn't see that you're having them. I'm saying he doesn't see you that way. He doesn't see you as the sick trying to get healed. He sees you as the healed and the enemy is trying to make you sick or trying to keep you down or to keep you from fulfilling his will. Does that make sense? Amen. <clears throat> because God's will is positive. His will is good for you, right? Now, so, <clears throat> you know, some people say, well, my circumstances, I just lost my job. So I'm jobless. And if I don't get another job in two weeks, I'm going to be homeless. Or maybe I'll be living in my car. I'm going to be broke. I'm going to be this. And you start, and now all of a sudden your image of you starts to be your circumstances. And the longer that goes on, now, <clears throat> this, is a, this is actually scientific also, because uh, when I was with the corrections department for Texas, uh, we used to have guys that they would call <clears throat> um, institutionalized. 
And what that means is that would be a prisoner that had been in prison so long that even when he got paroled out, he'd soon be back in prison because he didn't know how to live on the outside world because he only knew the prison system. And his image of himself was as a prisoner and that's all he could ever see himself. So that's all he could ever do. So he functioned that way. And some guys went and literally committed a crime on purpose and get it just to get arrested, just to get put back in <clears throat> because they didn't know how to function outside. That's because they had a wrong image of themselves. Now, I will tell you, and most people that if you talk to, and they will, uh, especially businessmen, things like that, <clears throat> most successful businessmen, uh, you know, they, all of them have success and all of them have failures. But a successful businessman doesn't see the failures as who he is. He just sees it as an obstacle to learn from and he goes over it and passes over it and then he comes back. Most, matter of fact, you know, they always tell you uh, your first million is the hardest to get. But if you get a million and then you lose it, the second million is actually easier to get. Why? Because you've already done it. It's the same principle. Once you do something, it's always easier the next time. Why? Because as long as the image of the failure didn't get a hold of you, if the image of a failure got a hold of you, then you will never overcome that failure and you'll always go back to the good old days of when this was or whatever it was. So you have to keep that image in you. Now, and, and honestly, it's like I've told you before, I know God is for me, I know he's with me. You take me anywhere, anywhere in the world, you know, take away everything I got, you put me anywhere in the world, and I will rise. Why? Not because of Curry Blake, but because God is with Curry Blake. <laughs> Amen? And I know that I can do all things through him that strengthens me. I know that with faith, all things are possible. Amen? And so all I have to do is make sure my faith is in God and whatever I've ever had, I can have again and even more of it because faith always grows. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. Now you can apply this to any area and whatever, whatever area you have need in is probably the area you're thinking about right now. Right? And if that's the first thought that comes to your mind, that's the area you probably need help in. So, <clears throat> now, so number one, most people only look at their circumstances to determine who they are and what they're capable of. So if they look at their current circumstance, they might say, I'm broke, I'm sick, I'm, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, whatever the current circumstances are, right? I'm a failure. They look at right now, and the bad part is as soon as they accept that, now that right now becomes also their future. So you want to make sure that the image you have in you is the right image that will help you become who God has intended you to be. Amen? Now remember, success is not measured in money, it's not measured in things. Success is measured to the degree that you accomplish what God has called you to accomplish. That's success. Amen? Amen. And you can't, nobody can really judge that but you because you know what God has called you to do, right? More than anybody else. Now God can give people words and tell them what he's called you to do. And that's prophetic words that actually calls out of you uh, what God has called you to do and helps you understand, yeah, that's God speaking. But usually it's as a confirmation. Now, the second thing, most people here, and this is the real problem. This, this is it, all right? You really want to get this. Most people never take the time nor make the necessary effort to truly change their self-image. What that means is they may push it back they may be getting some new image. They may have some, some balance there. But the problem is if they don't truly change down to the, I mean, really change, right, their self-image, then that old self-image would still be there. And any time there's a setback, that old self-image all of a sudden just comes right back in. And it goes, see, see, no, all, all that success, that was all a fluke because this is who you really are. You know, you're really a failure. And so you have to constantly, you have to really kill that old self-image and really go in and find out what God has said who you are, right? Which is what? That everything you put your hands to will prosper. Wow. Amen? And so once you start to have that self-image, you start to realize that if there is a setback, then you start looking for the opportunity in the setback. How many of you know that every time there's a problem, the opportunity in the problem is greater than the problem itself? Mm. Yeah. Amen? And so you can see this, every invention has come because somebody had a problem and somebody looked at the problem without complaining about it and just decided to do something and out of that problem came a great invention. Yes. Which in many cases led to the person, you know, getting wealthy, famous, something, whatever it is. But very few people, now listen carefully, people that do great things like that, 
most of them don't, they're not sitting around saying, what can I do that'll make me great, famous, and rich? That's not how they think. They're really not even thinking about great, famous, or rich. They're really saying, wow, what problem can I solve? In other words, here's problems. How can I solve this? You know, somebody ought to do something about it. Somebody ought to make something that'll fix this problem. They go, hey, you know what? I'm somebody. I could do it. Yes, sir. And then they invent it, and then the, whatever else comes with it comes with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the idea is not to chase wealth, fame, riches, and that kind of stuff. The idea is to solve problems. And when you solve problems, then, you, then because of Proverbs, Proverbs actually talks about this, but when you solve problems, then wealth comes because of a, being a problem solver. That's just the way it is, right? Now, and again, it's not about wealth. I'm just trying to tell you, you know, because most people's problems are in the area of health and wealth. That's just where most people's problems are. Third after that is usually relationships, okay? And sometimes relationships is based on health and wealth. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's true, okay? So... But most people never take the time nor make the necessary effort to truly change their self-image. This is the real key. They never take the time, the time to go into it. I was talking to somebody this week about prayer. And most people just, there's a, a problem comes up and they just blurt out a prayer. Oh, God, help me fix this. Oh, God, I'm in, I, I need help. Do something, you know. And, and they don't realize that God has said, okay, look, I'm here to help you. Uh, but you need to realize how the help comes. And the help doesn't come by your begging. If help came because you begged, everybody that ever begged would have help. Yeah. So begging is not the answer. So the answer is to go to the Word of God. Find the answer in the Scripture to your problem. And then start speaking the answer toward the problem. Why? Because the angels hearken to the voice of God's Word. Amen. And so whenever you have a problem and you see the problem, which everybody can see the problem, right? It doesn't take brilliance to see a problem. <clears throat> People that can point out the problem are a dime a dozen. The people that point out the solution, those are the ones that are worth their weight in gold, right? And it's the same thing in every area. So whenever you have a problem a situation going on, you go to the Word of God, you find the Scriptures, and then I love how, um, uh, well, E.W. Kenyon said it, but also uh, Brother Kenneth Hagin used to say it too. He said people should take the Word and make it, um, they, they should make prayer like a business in the sense that you, you present your case. You, you gather your material and you go and you present your case to God and the way you're presenting is you are speaking the answer and as you speak the answer of it, it allows the angels to hearken to the voice of His Word. So as you speak the answer to God, the angels are busy making it come to pass. That's the way it works, okay? And, but if you're just complaining, the angels are just standing there because they don't hearken to the voice of your complaint. They hearken to the voice of God's word. So you find the, whatever the problem is, you find the answer. And then, and if you, and listen, John Lake used to say it this way. He said, all right, we, we've prayed. Now let's just take five minutes and believe God. Amen. All right. Well, a lot of people pray and never take time to believe God. And all they do is talk, right? And they're just usually begging, crying, something. But the real key is, bef rather than just running to God quickly and just saying something, you know, telling him the problem as if he doesn't already know it, the better thing to do is to see the problem, find the reason for the problem, if you can see it, go to the Word of God, find the answer, gather together, and then present it to God. And say, God, here's what you said. Your Word says this. And then you start speaking that Word, and as you present it like a lawyer presents his case, right? And at the end, the, the verdict from the judge in heaven is going to be in alignment with his Word. Why? Because the judge has to follow, quote-unquote, the law Amen. of His Word. Amen? Does that make sense? Yes. Now, <clears throat> let's keep going. Okay, very possibly the number one problem uh, in the world today, and we've heard it under different things, more than likely is what I would call identity confusion. Yeah. Right? It's even been broken down to gender confusion and to racism. See, racism is just identity confusion. That's all it is. Somebody thinks somebody is better than somebody else because of some superficial thing, right? So it all comes back to identity confusion. In other words, when you really find out who God made you to be, then it's amazing how you will treat other people yeah. because you realize what God did for you, yeah. you can then pass it on to somebody else. And you realize that what God did for you and changed you, then as long as there's breath, they can change too if they need to. Maybe you need to change, right? right? 
and maybe both of you need to change, which is actually more likely the case, right? To some degree anyway. Now, so it, like I said before, here's some examples of people's self-image. I'm sick, I'm poor, I'm broke, I'm dumb, I'm, you know, you fill in the blank, maybe whatever you were told as a kid. And that's the image you grew up with. Now, I'm gonna give you, but every, and, and as I should say, every one of these examples came from them looking at their, their current circumstances. Now I'm gonna give you some Bible examples of people that had wrong image based on their circumstances, right? And every time you'll see this. So this is, remember I said present your case like a lawyer? So this is exhibit A, right? In our, in our, in our presentation, <laughs> exhibit A. Numbers chapter 13, verse 25. Now, if we went before 25, you would see that Moses, they're about to go into the promised land and he's about to send the 12 spies to go in and check it out. And so he has sent them in, they've gone in, they've come back with, you know, these huge, clusters of grapes and all these things, and they're come back going, wow, look at all this stuff, right? So in verse 25, it starts. It says, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land where you sent us, and surely it flowed with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. So what are they saying? It's a great place. Amazing place, right? Now, then he says, in verse 28, Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So now notice, first off, they said, this is a great place. It's amazing. Everything, just like we heard, <clears throat> you know, milk and honey, great uh, fr you know, fruit and great produce. And now notice, but then they keep talking. And instead of just stopping right then, they kept talking. And they talk about, oh, the people are strong. The people out there is walled cities, and you got these people and these people and these people, and there's all these different people all over. <clears throat> so you got all these different groups, right? Then it, now watch. And it says, get this right there. Yeah, there we go. And, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses. Now notice, he stilled them. What does that mean? The people started moving around, started jostling around, started talking about because they heard this, what the Bible is going to call an evil report. Okay? Now watch. And he said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. Amen. Now, notice Joshua and Caleb heard exactly the same thing that, and said the same thing, saw the same thing, basically. <clears throat> and they heard, now, they're saying the same thing, they heard the same thing that everybody else heard. But instead of responding like everybody else, Caleb, even in areas of uh, business and things like that, it's amazing, Caleb did exactly the right thing. Let's move now. Yeah. Let's do it now. Let's go up right now, because we can take it. And what was he doing? He just heard they're strong. They're all over the place. There's lots of them. There's walled cities. But that didn't deter him at all. Instead, he said, let's go up at once. Now, why did he say at once? Well, because he, he's smart, for one thing, <clears throat> had the wisdom of God. But the thing is, whenever there is trouble, the best thing to do is attack it quick. Yeah. Not to wait. The more, it, the more you wait, the longer you wait, the bigger the problem will get in your own eyes. And what happens is you end up getting as what is now known as paralysis by analysis. You'll keep trying to get more and more information. You'll keep trying to find this thing and you keep waiting and you're waiting for the best time. Well, I want to get all the information. What? No, <clears throat> a 70% solution today is better than a 100% solution tomorrow. Amen. Right? Why? Because tomorrow has the evil of itself. The problem is going to get bigger <clears throat> and you're going to need bigger answers tomorrow than you need today. So the problem is, and, and here's the thing, Caleb knew apparently that when people start seeing the negative, it's not going to take long for that gossip to get stronger and stronger, and pretty soon you've got a, re a rebellion on your hands, and you've got people that are going to start fighting against what you're trying to do. And the main thing is, no, move them forward now. If you get them moving forward in the same direction, they're all moving in the same direction, and pretty soon their minds will come in alignment with their feet. Amen. Right? And you get them moving in that direction. You don't want to wait and get a bunch of different little clicks going and all that kind of stuff. Instead, he says, we, let's go up at once. Let's go. Let's get the people mobilized. Let's get them busy. Let's get them thinking about winning, not thinking about how hard it is. Amen? Amen? Wow. 
Now watch. He says, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land. Now notice God calls it an evil report. Right? Why? Because, not because there were people there, not because there were walled cities. Because Moses told him, go check it out, come back and tell me what's there. What made it an evil report is when they said, we can't win. See, that's the evil report. Why? Because God said, this is the land I'm giving you. So it was already given in God's mind. He was already done. He's already said, it's there, it's yours, and I'm giving it to you. Now, you need to get there. And when people say, we can't, God said, that's an evil report because you're not agreeing with me. Now, now, notice this. Look at this next part. They brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great, sta uh, great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. Now, look at this. And we, here's the secret. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, why were they grasshoppers in the giant's sight? Because they were grasshoppers in their own sight. Do you see that? What does that mean? What, did they, what kind of image did they have in them? They had a grasshopper image. They, in their selves, they said, we can't do it. We're smaller than them. We're less than them. They're there. They got walled cities. There's giants. So their image... Now, notice, it didn't say that we, we can't do it uh, because these guys are so big. What they're saying is we can't do it because we see ourselves as incapable of doing it. And because that's how we see ourselves, that's how they see us. So in other words, if you don't, and listen carefully, what they were doing was they were encouraging cowardice in their own heart. And when you encourage cowardice in your own heart, then you also encourage courage in the hearts of those against you. Do you get that? Do you see that? So your own self-image will determine how other people see you, right? Now, admit it, it's your self-image that matters, right? But they will tell you, if, when you go into the military, one of the first things they do is teach you how to stand, how to walk, how to present yourself. Why? Well, there's two, well, there's several reasons, actually. But one reason is that they know that if you... If they teach you how to stand a certain way, walk a certain way, talk a certain way, that if you get your body in that position, your mind and your attitude will follow. If, if you came in here and I was up here and I'm doing like this and doing this, and that, you might think I'm praying, okay? But if, you, if I'm walking around like this through the halls here and you saw me, you go, oh, don't, don't mess with me. It looks like he's either in a bad mood or something's bad or something's going on. Or you might even ask me, Kurt, Kurt what's the matter? What? And I might look at you and go, nothing, you know. Well, why? Well, because, you know, your head was down and I had to stop something was wrong. You know, maybe I'm just, you know, looking at all the cracks in the floor. I don't know. You know, maybe, I, maybe I'm investigating, okay? But the idea is that if you see somebody like that, you automatically assume that's an attitudinal, attitudinal position, posture. You got that? So one of the first things they teach in the military is how to present yourself. And so they teach, number one, stand up straight, hold your head up, head back. Um, there was a lady the other day that we, I saw at a distance, I couldn't get to her, but she, and, and it's, it's amazing how you can know certain things, because I've been doing this for so long now, that I was looking at her, her head was like this, and she had a somewhat of a hunch in her back. And, and I pointed it out, and I said, you, do you say it? And I go, oh, yeah. And, and somebody asked me, you know, what do you think that is? Is that, you know, like a disease? Is it like an I said, no, no, no. I said, that's from years of bad posture. Because what it is is she's trained herself to walk this way over a period of time. And if you don't walk with good posture, you will end up doing that. And especially now with all the gadgets and computers and stuff, people are doing this more and more. You watch in the next 20 years, you're going to see a whole lot of that. Why? Because people don't realize you have to actually stop at certain times and just stand up. Right? You know, stand against a wall. Put your back and your shoulders against the wall to know what good posture is. And stand up straight. And when you stand up straight then it automatically puts you in a different frame of mind. Amen. When you're, whenever they, they will tell you, you know, chin out, head back, out, and you present yourself. And the, one of the reasons they teach military is that is because whenever you face an army and you see them marching towards you, you want, them, you want to know that they're serious, they're focused, and they're coming after you. You don't want to see, an, well, what you want to see is an army that's coming at you like this. 
you know. <laughs> and you look at me, yeah, we can beat them, you know. I can hit them over the head because they're putting it out there, you know. So, <laughs> so you just have to realize there's a way to stand, right, and present yourself. Why? Because God made us spirit, soul, and body. He made us three in one, right, after his image, so to speak. We made, he made us like that, and so that we are to, uh, the position of your body will help. It doesn't do it all, but it will help change the condition of your mind, right? And so it's, it's really important. That's why, you know, if you have children, you should be teaching them good posture. Why? Because it doesn't just affect their body. It affects their mind. It affects how they do things. It affects how they see themselves. If you see people in countries where you see people where they're always walking with their head down, there is a, a degree of respect to that, but most of it comes from shame, as we've mentioned earlier. And so there is an aspect of there where you have to realize that you're either going to function through shame or through courage, one of the two, because it's either love or fear. That's really what it comes down to. Now, look at this. He says here, uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 1. Now, the real key here, though, is that they had a, a grasshopper image of themselves. Then he says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Now notice, they believed the bad report. Why? Because it is natural for people to believe the bad. Automatically, they go toward the negative, right? And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Now notice, notice what happened. First, they hear a bad report, an evil report. And as soon as they get that evil report, now notice the people hear it, they believe it, and the first thing they do is they start crying. But now notice the second thing they do. Now they start to rebel against the leadership. This is a process. This is a normal way things go. People, usually people that are really mad, it's not that they're mad, it's that they're hurt. Right? And when they get hurt, then that turns to mad. Right? And so when you see people that are, seem to be always mad, it's usually because they are really hurt, and they've been hurt usually for a long time. Okay? And so all of that comes back to the same thing. Now, he says here, Notice they started, they murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt. Now notice they went from crying to rebellion, and now they're getting suicidal. They, want to, they, they wish they had died somewhere else, right? <clears throat> then he says, or, or would God that we had died in this wilderness, right? Or, and then he says in verse 3, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword? Now see, they've already, they're already defeating themselves. If they had faced an enemy right then, they would have gotten defeated. Why? Because they said, did you bring us out here to die by the sword? No, they ought to be saying, well, if there's enemies there and God gave us that land and he brought us out here to win. Amen? That's the way we should be thinking. That's the way they should have been thinking. Now, that's why whenever, you know, the self-imaging, okay, just for right now, just, and we're not talking about specifically about this right now, but this comes into it. There is an area of the will, and the will sits really between your spirit and your soul, your 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 mind, so to speak, okay? Because right now, now, I want you to think, just just think about standing up. Just think about it, right? Don't do it, but think about it. Can you, can you picture yourself standing up? Yeah. You can picture it, right? But yet, you're not standing up. Right. Why? Because the will has not been engaged, right? So you can have the image, but if the will is not engaged, the image doesn't matter, other than the fact that you'll just be you know, well, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so if you have an image of how you're supposed to be, but yet you never engage your will to enact it, then eventually you will just get depressed because you know you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Does that make sense? Now, when you know you're supposed to be doing something, you're not doing it, then the first thing that starts to happen is you start wanting to pick things apart, find blame, and start complaining about stuff. And then all of a sudden you start looking at everything around you and you go, well, it's this, well, it's that. And then because you're mad at yourself, you get mad at everybody else, yeah. right? And that's the process that it follows. So it's important that you engage your will with the image that God has put in you, right? Or otherwise you'll never accomplish it. And instead of getting better, you're just going to get bitter. I think it's Joyce Myers, Myers that always says that. You know, you can get better, you can get bitter. And many people end up getting bitter just because they never engage and then they want to blame it on everybody else for why they're not doing what they should be doing. So, notice here now, verse 4, 3, 3, yep. 
Did he, wherefore, and wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Now they're already killing off their kids. I mean, they hadn't even seen an enemy. They're just going by the tail of a couple of people that come back and said, yeah, they're big and they're bad. And they're like, oh, our kids are going to be killed. Our wives are going to be taken. It's going to be bad. Right? Oh, would to God we just already died. Well, you just go ahead and kill us. And, and you know, you have these people all the time. Well, just shoot me. Have you ever heard people say that all the time? Have you ever heard people say that? Yeah. Just shoot me. Well, just shoot me. Just shoot me. And, okay, you're gonna, you may think I'm crazy, but I will tell you what. I wish we had recordings because I, can, I would almost guarantee. No, not everybody. Not everybody. But if a person that is constantly saying, just shoot me, is ever in the building where a shooting takes place, they will be one of the ones that get shot. Yeah. Just that simple. Why? Because the Bible says you will have what you say. And you say, well, I don't really mean it. Uh, if you say it enough, you mean it even though you don't think you mean it. And honestly, the spirit and your spirit doesn't care if you mean it. It doesn't operate on what you mean. It operates on what you say. Do you get that? Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not saying everybody gets shot in these mass shootings that they were all walking around saying, just shoot me. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not making light of it because it's a horrific thing. I'm just saying, if I'm in a building like that, I will not get shot. That's right. Why? Because those words never come out of my mouth. Right. right? Now, I have said in the past that if I'm in a situation like that, I... I actually have a t-shirt that says the difference between me and you is I run toward gunfire. That's right. right? Why? Because it doesn't do any good to run away from it. That's right. I mean, if you're going to get shot, get shot in the front, not in the back. Right. right? It's just that simple. At least you might be able to stop something from happening. Right. Yeah. Amen? You can't always think about yourself. But I will tell you, with God on my side, I've had guys pull knives on me. Yeah. I've had guys pull guns on me. And I'm still here. And I got no knife wounds and no gunshot wounds. Amen? Amen? And I've never had to, well, from a Christian viewpoint, I've always been able to use the name of Jesus, and they stopped. Yes. All right? Well, I, that was not using the name of Jesus. That's, <laughs> that was another situation. <laughs> that was back, back then, yeah. Um, but that was a whole other situation. So. But when I have been walking with God and, and used the name of Jesus, it worked. Amen? Amen? So, and I can tell you all kinds of instances. There should have been somebody. Now, I wasn't intending to get over in this. There should have been somebody there that was able to say, gun jam. Uh, so, something. Yeah, I meant something in the name of Jesus. Because yeah. the name of Jesus works. It works. It, when it's used by a person with faith in God. It, it is that simple. All right? So, now... Again, going forward, they've already got their kids killed off here, right? Like we said, okay. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? Yeah, better to be a slave than to be out here dead, right? That's what they're saying. And they said one to another, let us make a captain, let us return to Egypt, right? They hadn't even seen the enemy yet. Now they've already went full circle. Now they're ready to go back into bondage. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Notice Moses and Aaron didn't get after them and scold them and go after them. They fell on their faces and began praying to God. Why? Because that's where the answer is, right? Then he says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spoke unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Now notice what he's saying. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which flows with milk and honey. So now he's saying, if God's with us, we can do this, right? So what's that mean? That means the other people didn't really believe God was with them. Notice they didn't say what God could do. They were always saying what we have to do. Well, you know, well, we should have died. Well, we, well, we got to go back. Well, let's make a captain. Let's go back. They were saying what they were going to do, not what God was going to do. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. So now we know that was rebellion. Notice that was a rebellion for them not to go into the promised land. Now listen carefully. As a Christian, see we have this idea that as Christians we get to do whatever we want. And we don't have any responsibility and God is just the blesser. And he is. He's a blesser. But that we don't have any responsibility. But the fact is he has brought us into our promised land but we have to possess it. 
Your promised land is health. You understand that? Your promised land is not sickness and disease and poverty and lack and pain and sorrow. That is not your promised land. Your promised land is health. Your promised land is having enough to be able to take care of your own and others also. That is your promised land. But notice, when you walk in the promised land, the land wasn't empty and barren. The land was full of enemies. It was full of giants. It was full of things that were trying to say. It was full of walled cities. They were trying to say, no, you can't have this. And that's exactly where you are today. That you're in your promised land, but if you look around at the giants and you look at every problem, I could give you a list of problems, right? I can give you five reasons. Number one, it ain't going to work. Number two, it ain't going to work because people. we don't have enough people. It ain't going to work because we don't have enough money to do it. I get, okay, well, if you got one reason, if it ain't going to work, you don't need five. Right. <laughs> you only need one. It ain't going to work. That's the only reason you need, right? But then people have, a, and they start looking at all their problems. Well, don't have enough money. Don't have enough uh, opportunity, don't have enough education, don't have enough somebody to back me, don't have all these things. As long as you're looking at it, you're looking at the situation. But you have to remember, those things are in your promised land. Those things are there, and they're trying to stop you from walking in the fulfillment of what God has given you. God has provided so that you can live in divine health. He has provided so that you can live a, a life that is able to be a blessing to others. Not, see, most people think, well, but I don't, I don't understand if, you know, if it's not uh, this job, then how, how would God get, you know, finances to me? Uh, God is God. There's all kinds of ways he can get finances to you. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at the opportunity. But as long as you're looking at the problem, you're not looking at the opportunity. Amen? Yes. Why? Because of the image you have in yourself. These people had an image. Notice, these people had been in bondage all of their life. They had only been out of bondage for a short while. Right? So what kind of self-image do you think they had? A slave image. They had the image of, well, we can't fight against warriors. We can't do these things. And yet they've seen you know, the Egyptian army swallowed up by the Red Sea. It's amazing because you'll see things happen and your mind will tell you, how did that happen? Did that really happen? And then years later you'll go back, did that really happen? It's amazing. When you were standing there, there have been times whenever I've seen the dead wake up. And then 15 minutes later, after, you know, everything starts to settle down, you're like, this thought, is, were they really dead? <laughs> and it's like, uh, they were cold. You know, they're dead, dead, no heartbeat, no breath, gone, all right? And yet your mind, your mind can't deal with that. Why? Because your soul is worldly. And, and so your spirit's going, yeah, fool, they were dead. That's, <laughs> you know, did you say in the name of Jesus, get up? Yep, okay, and they did. So there you go, they were dead, right? They didn't, listen, if they were just unconscious, they didn't wake up and become, un, you know, conscious just because you use the name of Jesus, right? Life had to come back into them. So, but your mind will try to talk you out of these things. Your mind will tell you why you can't do it. You know, you'll start to walk up to somebody that's sick and go, yeah, bless God, the Bible says I lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And before you get there, you got three reasons why you shouldn't talk to them. You know, well, what if they don't want it? What if they doing it? What if God's punishing them? What if God's doing something? You know, what, what if they don't want to hear my religion? Well, don't go give them your religion. Go give them freedom. Amen. Amen. Let them ask you how you did it. Right? right. We were at a Luby's the other day. Luby's? Luby's, yeah. And the lady, I don't know. Okay, there's a line of people, a line of people going through. And we're with everybody. And we're, we weren't with anybody, but we were there in the line. And people are going through, and they're going through, and they're checking out, and they're paying out the bill and all this. And they go on. And when we get up there, this lady stands there, and she goes, uh, for, I don't, for no reason, <laughs> just says, I tore my rotator cuff. And, and I, I've got pain in my hands, really, really bad. For no reason. She didn't tell everybody else that. She told it whenever I stepped up. <laughs> I wonder, have we got a sign on me or what? You know? <laughs> what's, what's up here? You know? What's going on? And so we went through all the stuff, you know, and I wouldn't go make a big deal because there was a line of people and I wouldn't make, and I said, so when I finished uh, paying, I paid with the card and when I finished, I said, all right, I said, what? I said ah, my name's Craig Blake. And she reached over to shake hands and I said, that pain in your shoulder is gone right now in Jesus' name. And she looked at me and she goes, oh, thank you. <laughs> it, was just, it was shocked. Her. I said, watch. I said, I do this all the time. I said, you watch. And I turned loose of her hand. We were going to sit down and eat. Started to leave. As I went out, I know she's moving her arm. She's doing everything's fine. No, showing no pain, right? Amen. God, will, he, he, he does divine appointments like that. Now, a, a, a torn rotator cuff is not something you can see. She had to tell me, or God would have had to tell me. In this case, she told me. So what am I going to do? 
Oh, that's pitiful. Can you hurry up and run my, 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 my card? Can you do that, please? I'm hungry. I want to go eat. No, there's an opportunity. You have to take that opportunity. Amen. Amen? And so God will bring people to you. He did that to John the Baptist. John the Baptist out in the middle of the wilderness, right? And what happened? People came to him, right? They didn't go to the temple to hear the fancy preachers. They went out in the wilderness to hear a guy that was dressed like a wild man, right? And so God will bring people to you. And you can't say, well, you know, I don't have this opportunity. Yeah, you do. Just be ready when it comes. And when you're, it's amazing. People that are ready for the opportunity recognize opportunity. Amen. People that are not ready for it don't recognize it. And the person is, right after that, they'll see it and they'll take the opportunity. And the other person go, wow, they're just so lucky, I tell you, I just don't have any luck at all. What? First off, shut up. <laughs> yeah. Quit saying that. You ought to, I tell people, I told people, I said, you know what? I ought to go to Vegas. Because every game I play, the first time I play it, I always win. I don't care what it is. Even if I don't know the rules, Amen. if somebody's explained to me, I win. Right. And I said, Amen. man, I ought to go to Vegas. <laughs> At least once, play one game on each table. You know, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know anything. You tell me about cards. I have no idea how to play cards. I have no clue. I don't know any card. Well, I think the old uh, twenty-one or whatever. I think I, I, that one. That's the only one I know. So that'd probably be the first one I had to go. The first table I had to go to. <laughs> no, but, I, but I don't know any of that. I don't, I don't play games. I've, I've never played those card games or any of that kind of stuff because it's just never interested me. But if I did, I'd win. You know, I went with a friend of mine to go bowling. I'd never been bowling in my life. He was a professional. I beat him. <laughs> so, so anyway, why? It's a blessing of God. It's just, it's there. And, but now, when I start recognizing it, I expect it. I expect it. I expect, I, I expect favor. I expect things to go my way. Amen? I just, well, you know what? In the end, it'll all work out. And if it hadn't worked out, it ain't the end yet. So we'll just wait and see, right? Because in the end, it's going to work out. It's going to work out in my favor. That's the way it is. So if you're going to be in business, be in business with me, not against me. Okay? See, I told you, I had some Summerall coming out early this morning. That's, that's pure Dr. Summerall right there. Let me tell you. So I guess I better get back in the scripture. Okay, so he said, uh, only rebel ye, not, rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Now, what do they say up there? Like, oh, they swallow up the people. He said, no, 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 we're going to swallow them up. You hear what he's saying? Now, what, what are we supposed to break? Give us this day our daily bread. Yeah, Lord, give me a battle. Give me a battle. Give me something to beat. Give me something to win, right? Something, why? Because if I'm going, if the, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Is that right? Amen. Thanks be unto God, which always caused me to triumph in Christ Jesus. Is that right? So if my steps are always ordered to the Lord and he has already ordained that I'm always to triumph, then it doesn't matter where I'm going, I'm going to win. Yeah. Isn't that simple? Yeah. But see, you, if you don't have that self-image, if you have an image inside of you, well, it will be the, you know, I tell you what, man, when that flu comes around, I'll be the first one to catch it. You what? I tell you, I get sick every year. I don't know what's going on. And I take every flu shot. I take them all and I still get sick. <laughs> well, stop putting the stupid stuff in your body to begin with. <laughs> you know, that's a whole other thing. Okay? So... Does this make sense? Yes. You have to change the, the image of you in yourself. Because I'm telling you, God can't do anything for you above the image that you have of yourself. Let me, let me show you. I've got other scriptures. And I'm, I'm trying to hurry here. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Amen. Okay, because I'm done preaching myself happy. I'm, I'm, when I get here, I'm going to go find something to do to win at. I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so now notice he says, uh, where are we at? What verse? Oh, yeah, verse 10. But all the congregation, well, he said, yeah, he said they're bred for us. Their defense has departed from them. Why? Because they're facing us. So they have no defense. You get that? And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Oh, well, look at there. As soon as you start saying, hey, we can do it. Get ready because somebody's going to start trying to pick up stones. Right? They're going to start trying to throw stones at you. They're going to tell you why you can't do it, why you're crazy, why you're in denial you know, whatever it is, you're delusional, something. Well, you know what? Be delusional and win. Yeah. Amen? Be delusional and overcome. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Don't listen. Listen, don't listen to people that have never done what you're trying to do. Right. If you're going to listen to people, at least listen to somebody that's either done it or done something like it that have actually done it. Yeah. Not to the people that tell you you can't do it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The reason, well, that's never been done. Well, that's because you've never done it. It'll be done now. Why? Because I'm doing it. Why? Because God is with me and all things are possible. 
Well, no, that's just impossible. Well, to you, why? Because you don't believe. All things are possible for him that believes. Amen? Do you realize when we say all things are possible for him that believes? Now, I know that. I mean, that's a scripture, so we're talking about God. But you have to realize he wasn't just saying healing. He wasn't just saying getting saved. He said, whatever you believe. Right. Okay? Maybe somebody said, well, man, you know, I've always had this dream in my heart to start a business, a particular type of business. But everybody says I can't do it. Everybody says, you know, they give me the reason why not. Okay, then what, what is, what's going on there? That's in your heart. And that now God is telling you all things are possible. Well, yeah, but nobody in our family has ever gone to college. Nobody in our family has ever graduated college. Nobody in our family has ever done this. So what? Be the first one. Amen. Just because it's never happened doesn't mean it's never not supposed to, you know? I mean, if you go back to 1700s, uh, 1500s, let's go way back, let's go back to the 1500s, nobody had ever flown at that point. Yeah. But how many people fly today? Millions, pretty much every day. People are flying. Why? Because somebody said, hmm, I bet, I bet we could do that. Right? And I mean, there's been all through history, people talk about it, but then you finally had some people actually start putting it and making it happen. Why? Because they believed it could happen. Why? Because all things are possible to him that believes. And if you got God behind you, how much more should it happen? Amen? Amen? I mean, with God behind you, you shouldn't even have all the mistakes and all the failures along the way. It ought to just be working a lot easier. So, he says here, in verse, where are we at? Yeah, verse 10, But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And as soon as, notice, as soon as they got ready to stone them, God shows up visibly and, you know, pretty much says, take your best shot. Right? Why? Because I can take you all out. Right? He'd already told Moses, I'm willing to take them all out. I'll take them all out and start all over. Right? So, and the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? You notice they did, God's glory didn't show up when they were singing. It showed up when they were ready to stone somebody that God had given uh, the commission to, to take them into the promised land. God showed up to protect the man that he put in position. Amen? You, you see that? He didn't show up when they were all worshiping at that point. Now, he showed up at other times of worshiping. But here, God doesn't just show up when people worship. He shows up also whenever people are about to rebel and cause some big problems that goes against his plan. Right? See, the problem with most people is you don't believe your plan is in alignment with God's plan. If you don't believe your plan is in alignment with God's plan, then you think God can't be for you. So automatically, you're, you've already got that in you that it won't work. So you're doomed for failure. But if you can see that the plan in you, somehow that God put that in you and that you're bringing it to pass, now God's behind you, so it's going to work. You know, it's the old saying, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Amen. See, there's all kinds of areas. And as they would say, success breeds success. And, and it's amazing. You can go into other areas and be successful in other areas just because you were successful in one area. That's the David principle. God was with me with the lion. He's with me with the bear. He'll be with me with this uncircumcised Philistine. So you have to have that mentality in you, the image that God is with you. He is for you. And, and no matter what you put your hand to, it's going to prosper. Why? Because you're doing what's right. I'm not talking about doing stupid stuff and you know, doing things that are wrong and morally or ethically wrong. I'm talking about doing things that will bless humanity, not just you. If you really want to bless, if you really want to, okay, if you really want to see God bless you, do something that blesses other people. Then God can bless you because it'll flow through you. So he says, how long will it be before they believe me for all the signs that I've showed among them? I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. And Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it. For you brought us this, up this people in your might from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land for they have heard that you, Lord, are among his people, this people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands over them, and that you go before them by day and a time in a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you will kill all these people as one man, if you're going to wipe them all out at one time, then the nations which have heard the fame of you will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them, therefore he has slain them. In other words, hey, he couldn't bring them in, so he just killed them all. Right? And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, not to kill, 
Okay. <laughs> According as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving an iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people. According to the greatness of your mercy, and as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Now look at this. He just, did he not just say pardon? He just said pardon this people. Isn't that right? right? The next thing he hears from God. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Ooh, that quick. Man. See, people think, well, I messed up, but I've confessed it. But now, you know, it's going to take me a year to get back where I was with God. Nope. Instant. Boom. Right then. Get back up. Run again. Amen. Don't spend time down. Watering it, because the longer you spend down, the longer the enemy has to work on your mind and tell you you'll never get back up. Yeah. As soon as you fall down, get back up. Run again. Believe in God's faithfulness. Believe in his grace. Believe in his forgiveness. Get up and run faster than you did before. Oh, Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, so notice how quick that was done. I, I, I was just amazed when I was even reading this again at how quick. I mean, Moses says, Lord, forgive. Let your power be great. Forgive these people. And God says, I've forgiven. I've, pow I've pardoned. Yes, I've already, it's done. I mean, man, amazing. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. Now, God may not keep record, but he had a number there. He said, these guys have tempted me ten times. He knew how many times they had tempted him. Right? Okay. So, <laughs> just... <laughs> So, he says, they have tempted me now these ten times. Where am I at? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> that they will not see. Now notice, and have not hearkened my voice. Verse 23. Surely they shall not see the land which I swore unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has another spirit in him. In other words, he's not negative. He's positive. He believes he can do it. He has a spirit of faith. He said, these guys that went out and they said this and they tempted me and did all this, they won't see it nor will the people that believe them see it, basically. But now notice he said, but Caleb, he's different. Why? Because he believed me and has followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? Here, very quickly, I'm going to be doing teaching on murmuring, grumbling, and complaining. And I'm going to show you what they are and how not to do them. Right? Because people still do it today. And he said, How long will they murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. In other words, you said about me, I will be that way to you. I cannot rise above what you say about me. Right? He said, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and all that are numbered with that were numbered of you, according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swore to make you dwell therein, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, notice what he's telling them. He's saying, you've got to get you a new image. You've got to understand you followed me. These other people didn't, and I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to, uh, why? Because they don't have the image that they can get into, the new, into this promised land. So I'm going to, they're going to go, and do you realize, there may be, I mean, think about it. You don't want to be the person everybody's waiting to die right. to get out of their way to get into their promised land. <laughs> Amen? Now, how can you tell if you're the person everybody's waiting to die? If you're like, well, I don't know. I just don't think we can do it. Well, you know, I just don't think that'll happen that way. Well, that'd be nice, but I don't think so. Well, now let's be realistic. Yeah. Brother, you got to use wisdom. Yeah. yeah, well, there's two kinds of wisdom, heavenly and devilish. And you're talking about the devilish kind, yeah. right? Because the wisdom kind says follow God Amen. and do what he said you can do. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Now, notice this. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, it says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, right, essentially. And he says, now notice, thinks in his heart, not in his head. In his heart, Amen. right? Why? Because what's in your heart will come out your mouth, yeah. right? Now, your head will argue with it, but the fact is you don't want to, you want to make sure that what's in your heart, because what, how, what you think in your heart is how you are. And we can go into a lot more on that, but now I'm going to give you exhibit, exhibit B, and we'll be done here in just a minute, 
Okay, so that was the first one. We're never doing the second one because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing has to be established. So now we're going to bring it home. Judges chapter six, verse one. And the children of Israel is another person that had a bad self-image and did not have the image that God had of him. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they come up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till, thou, until you come to Gaza. And left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. Now notice what was happening. This is Deuteronomy chapter 28. It says others will, you'll, you'll plant and others will come in and eat it. And that's what they did. And they come in and got it all. So they were living under the curse of Deuteronomy 28 of not following God. Okay? And because of that, now they were still planting, but other people were eating it. Now, notice he said, uh, they, verse 4, and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till you come to Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, ne neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they come up with their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers. Well, now there's a different kind of grasshopper. Okay. For multitude, for both they and their camels were without number and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished, impoverished, in poverty, right? Because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which saith unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice." Now, notice this. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak. So an angel comes and sits under an oak, which was in Ophrah. Not, not the actress. Okay. <laughs> that pertained unto Joash, the Abizarite. Abbey Ezrite. Get it right. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Now, notice. He was hiding behind the wine press to hide it from the Midianites so that they wouldn't see it and take it. So already you know he doesn't have a good self-image. He doesn't think he can win. He doesn't think he can fight. He, all he's trying to do is hide. He had shame. He had guilt. What, you know, whatever's going on there. But he had to hide to be able to try to keep his food. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Now notice, this is how God saw him. Amen. This is not how Gideon saw Gideon. This is how God saw Gideon. So you realize that, that God can have a completely different image of you than you have. Is that possible? Okay. Now, he says, And Gideon said unto him, O oh, my Lord. Now, I don't know if he said, O oh, my Lord, as in Lord, or if he said, O oh, my Lord. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If the Lord be with us, then notice what he says. First thing, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? What did he start doing? First thing, he started complaining. Well, if God's with us, isn't that what he just told him? He said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Well, if, the God, if God is with us, why is all this trouble happening? You ever feel that way? Where is God? Why is, why, God, why are you letting all this happen? Why is all this going on? I mean, he's, now watch. He says, The Lord be with us. Why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our father told us of? Saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So he knew what the problem was. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might. And you will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? You notice how quick he expected him to go? He said, go in this your might, and you will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. And then he says, have not I sent you? And what are you doing still standing here? I just told you to go, and you're standing here. I mean, in one sentence, right? When God says something, he means right now. He means go, move, right? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, says it again, Wherewith shall I save Israel? He just, he's just been commissioned, just been told, you're going to be the one that God is going to, you're a mighty man of valor, and you're going to be the one that God uses to deliver Israel from the Midianites. And the first thing he says is, how am I going to do that? Now watch. Remember when I told you the two things you remember was a while ago? Second was, most people never take the time or effort to change their image. What's the first one? 
They always judge who they are, their, their self-image, by their current circumstances. Remember that? Now look at this. He says, Wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor. Current circumstance in Manasseh. And I'm the least in my father's house. Current circumstance. He's looking at the physical. He's looking at what's going on around him, not looking at what God is telling him. He should have been going, man, this is wonderful because all this other stuff, this is garbage. It's bad. And I'm so glad to hear this good news. Let's move into it. But he didn't do that. He started saying, but what about this? He kept going back to his life, right? And he said, and the Lord said unto him, surely I will be with you and you will smite the Midianites as one man. Now, did he, did, did the angel of the Lord, the Lord, he said here, did he say, uh, wait a minute, Gideon, um, your family isn't poor. He didn't say, uh, Gideon, you're not the, the least in your household. He didn't say that. He totally ignored current circumstances and said, I said, I'm with you. And I said, you're going to conquer the Midianites. So what's he saying? Don't look at your current circumstances. Look at the fact that God is with you. Right? Now, I don't know what your circumstances are. It could be, I'm sure some of it has to do with sickness or you know, health issues and different things, but I don't know what all your circumstances are, but I can tell you this, or let me ask you this. Is God with you? Because if God is with you, then you can overcome all these circumstances. Do you understand that? Because God does not want you under the circumstances. He created you to be an overcomer over the circumstances Amen. and to put your foot on these things. So forget those things and quit using those as excuses of why you can't do what God told you to do. Because I'm telling you, whatever, listen, I've had people tell me, well, I would go to the mission field, but you know, I got little kids. Careful. Because what you use as an excuse not to obey God, many times the enemy has an open door to come in and try to take them out. Right. So don't use anything as an excuse. You know, if you're going to go to the mission field, take your kids with you to the mission field. Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, they'd probably be raised better on the mission field than they would be in, in, in everyday life. Put it that way. Because yeah. right? they find out what's real. They find out what's important. But don't use, well, I, I just don't have enough money. Uh, no, what you don't have is enough self-image of what God has put in you to do what you're supposed to do. You don't have the will to engage what God has put in you. you. You know what's in you. You know literally in you what you're capable of. But many of you, you as we talked about before, you've got dreams, you've got ideas, things that you know God put in your heart. You, many of you got prophetic words that God has spoke to you 10 years ago, 20 years, you know, different times, a year ago. Who knows? And he's spoken these things to you. And you've got to the point now where you're saying, where are all the miracles? That God has promised. Where are these prophecies? I don't see these prophecies coming back. Why? And you started murmuring against God rather than going, God, you said. God, you said. You sent a prophet that spoke to me and said this. Now, where is that? Because you said it and I believe you. Instead of, well, you know, uh, God, you said that I'd be the first person in my family to own a new home and to have my home built from the ground up. You said I'd be the first one. Ah, but I don't see it. It ain't happening. So, I, well, guess what? It ain't going to happen as long as you talk like that. You have to go back to God and tell him, you said this. This is what, what a prophet said to me, and I believe your word. At your word, Lord, be it unto me according to your word. Amen. And you start, now that's just one example. It could be all kinds. Of, it could be about starting a business. It could be about going on the mission field. It could be going into ministry. It could be anything that God has put in your heart. that You know that. But you have to decide not to let that dream die in you. Not to let that prophetic word die Paul told Timothy, he said, listen, I know what's in you. I know the prophetic words that's gone in you. I know that by the laying on of the hands of, of the presbytery, I know the prophecies and, I've, and these prophecies have been given so that you can war a good warfare. Amen. Prophecies are not given for you to go, oh, look, here's my prophecy. Here's who I'm going to be someday. Prophecies are for you to war a good warfare. How do you war a warfare with prophecy? You say, Lord, you said, and I believe. Be it unto me according to your word. And you start warring that warfare with words. And you start saying how it will be. Okay. Now, he says, and he said unto him, now notice what Gideon says, if now I have found grace in your sight, then show me a sign that you talk with me. In other words, listen, now notice he says, show me a sign that you're talking with me. Let me know I'm not crazy, that I'm hearing voices, right? Let me know that I'm, this is actually happening, right? Because everybody else thinks I'm crazy. I go back and tell them what God said, and they go, <laughs> How do we even know God talked to you? So show me something. Give me something. Now, he was dealing with unborn again people. They had to see a sign. How many of you are dealing with unborn again people? See, you don't need signs. You're a believer. They need signs. 
That's why he said, these signs shall follow believers. He didn't say believers will follow signs. He says the signs will follow believers, and because of the signs, unbelievers will become believers. Wow. Amen? But at some point, you're going to have to be able to step out and go, you know what? God, I know, I know what your word says. And I know what your dream for me, I know what your image in me is. And I can tell you, I, I'm even growing up uh, over the last, you know, well, especially the last 30 years, the image that God has in me. I, when, when I started, I didn't have that image. I had somewhat of an image of it, but it wasn't what I, what I see because now I've come more into a fullness to know what God can do through me. And I wouldn't have, it wasn't something I was thinking about. I wasn't planning that. I didn't sit down and go, well, here's what's going to happen. You know, in, in 10 years, I'll start this. And in 20 years, we'll have a, a worldwide ministry and we'll have, uh, you know, churches on every continent and we'll be planting life teams. And we'll be, that wasn't there. God had to develop that self-image because if it had shown me that in the beginning, honestly, I'd have probably thought, no, nah, this no, nah, not, not me. Surely God's got somebody better qualified. And I'm sure he does. But the better qualified person probably said no and didn't do it. And so God used me, right? And because he just knows that I'll just do it and won't quit. And the tougher things get, the madder I get, and the more I dig in, and the more it's going to happen, right? So the best thing, if you want to see me do something, the best thing to do is tell me I can't do it. You watch. Hide and watch. It'll happen. Why? Because I know God is for me. Amen? Amen. But I wouldn't have put myself in that position. Back then, I'd have thought, well, that's probably just ego or something. But now we see it happening, and I'm not even making it happen. I'm just presenting truth, and people are running with it, and it's changing Christianity all over the world. Right? And because people are preaching this message and people are, I'm getting testimonies all the time of healings and different things. Praise so, God. finally, well, pretty much finally, yeah, finally. Gideon had, a different, Gideon had a different inner image about himself than God did. Gideon was only considering his current circumstances. Give you one more real quick. Try one more. Okay. John chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went under the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, I'm, I'm, you know, the real question is, where's the man? Because she wasn't committing adultery by herself. But only she shows up there. Isn't that right? Because it's all the men that drug her up there. Whole another sermon there. Okay. So, anyway, okay. It says, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a, first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, shows that the older you get, generally the smarter you get, okay? <laughs> even unto the last, not always, just in general, and Jesus, <laughs> unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, Go and sin no more. Now, here's the question. What do you think that woman's self-image was? She was committing adultery in a place where that was a law that you could die for it, right? You know she had shame. She had guilt. She had condemnation. No, not even including whatever was there beforehand that would cause her to get to that point, right? So her image in there. But now notice, in one motion, Jesus said, I don't condemn you. And at that moment, all that left, and immediately, and now he said, go and sin no more. He expected her life to change. But notice, it happened in a moment. It didn't take forever. Right? So, <clears throat> the last uh, scripture I will mention is, well, actually there's two of them, but they go together. <laughs> okay. I know, I keep, I'm trying, I'm trying. Okay. <clears throat> so, Genesis 1, and you've heard these before, but I just want to tie these together because we're talking about the image inside of us. Genesis chapter 1 verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man 
in our image. After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over all the cattle, over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Notice three times in two scriptures, two verses, he says in his image. He emphasizes it. In this last one, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him says the same thing twice, back to back. In other words, why? Because we were, re we were created in God's image and that image was, was tainted and messed up at the fall and man lost his sense of image, the image that God has in him. But now, when we got born again, now we are recreated in the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. We are predestined to be conformed to the image of his dear son. That's the image. Your potential is so phenomenal. And I'm not talking about just healing the sick. Do you realize, okay, you do realize that Jesus was God's son before uh, he ever healed the sick. Right. Remember at, at the River Jordan? And here he is 30 years old. 30 years, he never healed a person. 30 years, no miracles, nothing. And yet, as soon as he comes up out of the water, uh, they hear a voice that says, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. He was already his beloved son. And he said, in whom I'm well pleased. And he hadn't done a thing. Isn't that right? Except be obedient to now step into his new phase of life. So all that time beforehand, all that time, he was still God's son. Right? Amen. Now, he was, and we know that he was a carpenter or a carpenter's son, it says. Right? Now, let me ask you this. Do you think his business was good whenever he was carpentering? You think, I mean, it, he, you think he'd have probably been known as, wow, this guy does good work. He didn't do shabby work. Right? Why? Because what does Proverbs say? Proverbs says that if you're slack in how you do your work, that uh, basically it says that your work won't prosper. And so he, taught, he says skill brings success. He actually says skill brings uh, wealth in one place in Proverbs. So I can tell you, Jesus was good at what he did. Now imagine if he had not had to go into ministry in the sense that we see him. Imagine if he had been a farmer. Or imagine if he had been a fisherman. Imagine if he had been able to go into business. You think he would have still been preaching? Of course he would have been. Why? Because he knew truth. But at the same time, you think his, his farm would have been one of the most prosperous? It, it would have been blessed, right? You think he would have caught fish? He wasn't even a fisherman. And he caused boats to overflow with fish. And he wasn't even a fisherman. Right? Why? Because God was with him. See, that's what I want to get you to see. I want you to realize God is with you wherever you're at. Whatever business you're in, your business should prosper because you're there. Even if you work for somebody, you ought to be like Joseph and that business should prosper just because you're there. Right. Just because you're there, right? And God will cause favor to come to you because they'll recognize, man, you know, whenever you go off on vacation, business drops. Man, when you're back in here, it prospers. And it's not even, it's departments you don't have anything to do with. God has ways of bringing attention to you, right? And you end up running the company. Why? Because God is with you as long as it doesn't just all stay with you. Right. Amen? Amen? So you need to take the time to change the image, and that takes time, and we'll probably talk about that maybe next week, about what the actual process of how to take the time to change the image in you to line up with what God has. Amen? Amen. Of course it has to do with healing the sick. Of course it, all that stuff. It has to do with everything, but it has to do with everyday life too. Amen? Amen. Did you get anything out of this? I know it was long, you know, I apologize for taking a bit too long, but, you know. So, anyway. So, well, uh, I'm going to pray. Now, if you came and you need ministry, I'll be glad to minister to you. My team will help organize that. Uh, but in the process, yes, if you would, please fill out cards. If you want me to minister to you, please fill out the card, usually in the back of the chair in front of you. It'll say ministry card. It'll have it on there about the ministry. Um, what the problem is, that kind of thing, please fill that out. But uh, those of you that are watching by internet, watching live, or watching in the future by some other device, we're going to pray for you right now. Those of you that don't need ministry and you're just going to leave, I'll pray for you also. So first off, Father, we thank you. Your word is absolutely true. We can believe your word, and when we believe your word, we're believing you. And we thank you, Father, that as we believe you, all things are possible. Father, we thank you for the image in us 
that you have of us. Father, that we can believe that you can do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, that you can bless us coming and going. Father, that you can do things even above and beyond what we can even ask or think about. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for opportunities. We thank you for the opportunity to see us as you see us and to present you to others. So, Father, in the name of Jesus right now, we thank you and we bless you. Now, in the name of Jesus, those that are under the sound of my voice, whether present or by distance through internet or any other means, we say in the name of Jesus, if you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, do it now. Don't wait for any motion. Do it because it's the right thing. Do it because God, Jesus died to save you. Accept that right now. Just come to make him Lord of your life. And whatever means you need to do that, to say it, but make him Lord of your life. Confess it to him that he is Lord and that you will obey him. And the minute you do, inward, your life will be absolutely changed and then it will start working its way out through your life. Circumstances will change. You'll see things change. So if you're not born again, get born again now in Jesus' name. Those of you that are sick, right now in the name of Jesus, that sickness and disease has to bow its knee. It cannot remain in you. It will go. It will leave and never return. Every symptom will go. You be healed now Amen. in Jesus' name. Healed and made whole. Every bit in Jesus' name. We set you free by the stripes of Jesus and through that name that's above every other name. We thank you for it and right now. Be healed now in Jesus' name. So be it. So be it. Amen. Amen. Now the rest of you, if you uh, need to leave, you're free to leave. And then I will be right back out, put my things up. We'll come back out and minister. Other than that, God bless you. And we will hope to see you next week. Um, yep, can't think of anything else. So I'll stop there. God bless you.